This cabinet meeting is being filmed and the recording will be available on the Council's website. The images and sound recording may also be used for training purposes within the Council. Anybody speaking that does not wish to be filmed should make themselves known to the camera operator, please. Thank you very much. Right, so moving on, we have a bumper agenda this evening. It's a game of two halves. We're looking at the impact of the current financial squeeze, which is affecting the Council. Um, caused by inflation, rising demand for services, circumstances that are well beyond our control. Despite this, we have a very prudent uh, set of management pl in place, uh, and we've had that in place for the last three years. So I'd like to thank officers and Councillor Samuels uh, for that e exemplar record. We do have challenges ahead though, but we have a strong team in place and a strong track record of balancing the budgets. As we move ahead uh, with this work, we will make sure that sharing information is transparent, for example, last week we held two very good webinars which are available on YouTube. On the other hand, most of tonight's business is made up of really welcome reports, highlighting how we are delivering our priorities and moving ahead with significant projects to improve life for the residents of Bath and North East Somerset. We're looking at a really positive change to bring adult social care back in-house, essentially reversing the privatisation of this service. We're delivering truly affordable homes for local residents, including specialist housing for some of the most vulnerable in our society, and making plans to be a good landlord. We're moving ahead with improvements in transport and air quality, including funding to support sustainable transport schemes across the area and taking further action on the clean air zone. We're giving people a bigger say in finding ways to listen to a wider range of people in our society, and we're ambitious for the local economy. Driving regeneration for one of our key commercial areas in Bath, along with housing, jobs, energy efficiency, and the big anchor project, which is the Fashion Museum. This master plan follows high street regeneration projects across Bath and North East Somerset. So that's all some of the really positive stuff that we're hearing from tonight, and I'm proud of every single piece of work that's being done by our fantastic council team and our amazing cabinet that we have here tonight. We continue to deliver our positive priorities despite the real pressures on our budgets. Before we get started, though, I'd like to invite our cabinet members to introduce ourselves, and I'd particularly like to welcome back Councillor Samuel. Um, it is, it's a great pleasure to see him back in the room, so uh, great to see you, Richard. I will start with you to introduce yourself, then, if that's okay. Um, I'm Councillor Richard Sanner, I'm one of the two councillors for Walcott, and I'm responsible for. Um, resources. Evening everybody, uh, I'm Andrew Rigby, I am a councillor for Bathwick and I'm cabinet member for transport. Uh, David, uh, councillor for Mendip Ward, cabinet member for neighbourhood services. Uh, Mark Roper, Councillor for Newbridge, uh, Cabinet Member for Economic Development, Regeneration and Growth. Uh, I'm Tom Davis, the other Councillor for Walcott Ward and Joint Cabinet Member for Adult Services and Council House Building. Thank you, Tom. Uh, um, Sarah Warren, um, Councillor for Bath Avon North Ward and Cabinet Lead for Climate Emergency and Sustainable Transport. Hi, I'm Alison Vaughan, um, councillor for Whitcombe and Lincoln Ward and cabinet or joint cabinet lead with Tom for adult services and council house building. Thank you, uh, Hello, I'm Dina Romero. I'm uh, a councillor in Southdown and I'm cabinet member for children, young people and communities. And last but not least, councillor Tim Ball, Twitter Ward councillor, cabinet member for planning and licensing. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. Right, uh, we do have some formalities still, emergency evacuation procedure, no, thank you. If the continuous alarm sounds, you must evacuate the building and proceed to the assembly point. From this room, you follow the green running person signs to the exit, either using the marble staircase at the end of the building, nearest to Bath Abbey, or the main staircase. Please do not use the lifts. The assembly point for this building is in Orange Grove on the green outside Browns. Thank you, Marie. All right. Uh, apologies for absence. There is none received. Uh, declarations of interest. Uh, Councillor Davies. Yeah, Chair, I'd just like to record uh, an interest in item 
The agenda item on the Valley Floor to Cleverton Down Cycle Route, because I'm an employee of King Edward's School, that's mentioned in the report. Okay. Do you mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Any other? Yes, Councillor Mayor. Hello, um, I'd like to declare an interest in item 15, which is a, about land to the rear of 892-123 English Coombe Lane, as I am a nearby uh, resident of that, in that road. Duly noted. Thank you, oh, Councillor Mayor. And I will be leaving uh, for that item yes. as well. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, urgent business agreed by the chair. There is none. So we'll move to item six, which is questions from the public and councillors. Uh, there are 20 questions uh, from councillors and 24 questions from the public. And I believe we have a supplementary question from Councillor Jackson. Councillor Jackson, the floor is for the supplementary question. Sorry, are you addressing me? Yes. I'll do better than that. Yep. I wasn't fully plugged in. No, no problem. The floor is all yours. Yeah. Well done. Um, it's a very interesting answer, but it's only half, it only answers half the question, um, because these, these were, the point is that these worthy gentlemen who surround us, typical icons of the patriarchy, would you not think that they are not representative of Bath and North East Somerset today, and that in their own lifetimes they were not representative and would you not think it would be a good idea to have either modern pictures there or um, portraits of women like the philosopher Hannah Moore, who was often in Bath, or Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, who had such a big political influence on the Whig Party. Um, would you not like to consider replacing them with something a bit more appropriate for 2022 so that we can demonstrate, if you think this is correct, uh, that this is an inclusive council and we want to encourage women in political careers. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Jackson. I, actually, I fully agree with you. When, when I show people around this chamber, um, it, it's an, a really, really impressive chamber and we're very, very lucky to be the custodians of it. But one of the things which is a little bit embarrassing is that everybody on the wall is, is a white old male. Yes, so I do fully agree with you. There is a lovely slot available over there, though, and I would fully endorse that to be the first uh, lady should, should go in that slot. But I, I'm more than happy to have a chat with the Arts Department and, and see what we can do. I, I have no doubt that some of these portraits are probably very expensive as well, so we need to find somewhere to hang them. All right, thank you, Ellen. It's a very good point, and thank you for that. Yeah. Yes, Councillor Pritchard. Sorry. Yes, I would like a supplementary. Yeah, no problem. Go ahead. And it's um, with regard to the question to Councillor Alison Bourne, uh, question 12. And um, in her reply, she actually states uh, the council will maintain robust discharge arrangements that support the wider health system, whether the services are provided in house or not. So do I take it from that that she's suggesting that she is responding positive, positively to my suggested prudence in the approach she takes to bring in uh, the, the, the services adult social care in-house? Councillor Bourne, you, you have the right to reply or you can say that you'll give a written response. Um, I'll give you a written response within five days. Thank you. Thank you, Gary Pritchard, for the supplementary. And there are no other supplementary on in the councillors in the room, are there now? Okay. Please. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Um, statements that take petitions from the uh, public and councillors will move. Uh, Mr. Baldwin, Chair of the Search Residence. Yes. The floor is all yours. Yes. No, um, uh, the first person is, is, is not here, I'm afraid, so they, yeah, you're, the, you're, the, you're the opening act of the night. Emphasis on act, not opening, I hope, or maybe the other way around. Good evening. Um, when I have spoken previously on the subject of livable neighbourhoods, it has been to encourage you not to waver in your and our aspirations for meaningful LNs within our community. The important word here is not livable, it's not even neighbourhoods, it's meaningful. Powers, I believe, have now been delegated to decide how best to prioritize and implement LN interventions within our local communities. 
subject to phased and effective public consultation. This important delegation of powers will be judged as being a success if it indeed turbocharges the implementation of at least one or two effective and substantial livable neighborhoods. The introduction of relatively minor traffic management interventions, important though they are to their immediate local neighborhoods, will not generate the far wider community and citywide benefits of a substantive livable neighborhood, which is required to test and yes, perhaps challenge all the aspects and nuances of a fully fledged scheme. Cabinet, I am not one of those cynics who believe that as you edge towards next May's elections, you will merely initiate relatively minor traffic interventions in order to tick some notional manifesto box. As I have said before in this chamber, I believe you are all braver than that, and I'm sure our officers are also braver in creating some meaningful LNs in our city. I can best speak of our own Cara neighborhood, which has particular aspirations for an effective and meaningful LN. It is a community, contrary to some opinions, that reflects a very mixed and varied demographic and household profile. As a local neighborhood and community, we represent a perfect example of where a substantive livable neighborhood could, no, should be introduced. And against a background of likely worsening local government finances, our detailed concept would be in many respects relatively low cost. Value for money is a key element in our proposition. In the meantime, as a community, we did not sit by and expect our council to do everything for us. We have initiated and actually undertaken improvements to our area's public realm to commence the process of making our neighborhood environment more livable and attractive, and by so doing, encouraging greater active mobility. That work continues. Within CARA's livable neighborhood concept are significant benefits to the city as a whole. Our catchment area represents a key heritage zone, which is the next most popular visitor destination after the area immediately surrounding the abbey and the pump rooms. Introducing livable neighborhoods will improve our area for local residents and visitors alike and act as a catalyst for the needed regeneration of the Savile Row and Bartlett Street Quarter. Cabinet, with powers being delegated to hopefully turbocharge the introduction of fully fledged LNs, let's ensure the mandate includes the introduction of at least some substantive, effective, but as I said earlier, really meaningful livable neighborhoods. Our city deserves no less. Thank, thank you for you. the extra time. No problem, Mr. Wayne. Thank you very much. No and, uh, and please thank Cara residents for all their hard work. Yeah, it's it's. Thank you. Definitely noticed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, right, moving on to uh, Mr. Grixoni, please. Have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you, Councillor Guy. Uh, title of my uh, talk tonight is changes of direction in the council. So, although things of greater concern to our country are obviously in play today, most especially with the change of our monarch and Russian instigated war in Europe and the pressures those create in a post-pandemic country. But with these things in mind, we must surely do our utmost to work together where we can. I personally abhor polarization in any areas of life and always make my best efforts to find a sensible center ground. And I truly hope we can do so in this and the next council. And with, within that, as some of you might be aware, I stand here now not as a genuinely a very concerned citizen, but also a prospective councillor candidate for Western Ward, where I grew up. So I find myself here today having been previously forbidden from speaking three times um, due to a misguided and, in my view, undemocratic and, to be blunt, somewhat chilling interpretation uh, of the council guidelines on such events, where, thankfully, you changed your mind, lightly forced by your own more enlightened councillors, uh, and I thank those who did for doing so. My aim today is to give you examples of areas such as that where you might have rightly U-turned um, in your often, in my estimation, high-handed policies and to give you others where I hope to be able to persuade you to reconsider the errors of your approach. It's not just local opposition despairing at you. I've lost count of the number of times this council has featured in the Rotten Borough section of Private Eye. Maybe some of you have shares, I don't know. Anyway, on that freedom of speech, your demand for full written statements before the event was not a good look. It smacked of protecting against scrutiny, uh, which is an all too common theme here in, in my estimation. And being uh, too thin-skinned to hear views 
that are not your own. It's a genuine concern, this, and I, I do hope you, you, you hear me. You advertise yourself for better public involvement, uh, not less. Uh, an example, recycling. We did get rid of the tip tax. Uh, thank you for eventually seeing sense, Councillor Wood. Um, making recycling more difficult or charging for it will always result in less of it and more fly tipping. We hope you don't you turn on your policy to keep providing a full service within the city. On connectivity, we need to be a destination that business wants to come to, not to be uh, discounted. As an example, 5G masts refused through the precautionary principle. For that, uh, I, I believe you're pandering to the tinfoil hat brigade, so beware of that. Please change your direction there to aid progress for the city and the area. Tuffle Fields, uh, U-turns in every direction there. Uh, you describe it as an environmentally sensitive site. As Councillor Just David is the member advocate for biodiversity, the irony is not lost to me, so over to you, Jess, on that. Transport, so much disarray on the Cleveland Bridge, something that should have been done during lockdown. It's sadly too late to U-turn there, and all we have is a traffic lockdown. Uh, please do your best to turn that round, not try and block against uh, HGVs coming through a national trunk road. You might well delude yourself in the Twitter echo chamber or expensively produce to propaganda, for example, by publishing photos of one side of a street, the other side being overgrown, and such a, a poor advert for UK's only UNESCO World Heritage Site. So be prouder, please, on that uh, sense. Uh, you turn where you need to, less uh, Voltaire Fachi, more look after our beautiful city and countryside. Also, please accept that it is our job to hold you to account as best we can. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Sony. I was generous and let you have as much time as I did with the last speaker. Uh, any questions? Councillor Ball and Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. Nigel, lovely to see you tonight anyway. Can you, hand on heart, actually say you believe every word you said to us this evening? Or are you just trying it on? Thank you. Absolutely. It's, a, it's a difference of opinion. Don't get me wrong. It's a, um, we are here to hold uh, the council to account. That is our job. Uh, at the same time, I'm not going to make up stuff. Obviously, there's an element of opposition. There's an element of different parties. But I truly believe that we have to work together. We don't know what's going to happen uh, next May. And we have to do our very best for the city and, and the area. And, and sometimes just petty point scoring is not needed. I accept that. And some people on both sides probably do that. But I do genuinely believe what I'm saying now. I, Thank so. you very much. Um, Councillor Wood. Uh, good to see you, Martin. Uh, uh, definitely appreciate some truth in your statement about the guaranteed service of recycling centres in, in Bath. And it was good to, good to hear that. Um, would you uh, denounce the Conservative leaflets distributed in a number of wards in Bath um, which say the opposite that you said and actually tell a lie about the uh, closure of Midland Road, saying it's imminent, whereas there is no imminent closure of Midland Road. And as you said in your speech, um, there is no gap in provision at any point for the recycling centre. Well, as I said, uh, thank you, Councillor Wood, uh, as I said in, in my uh, short um, talk there, it, it's more a concern that much as the Canesham Tip, and I know the tips very well. I go down there quite a lot myself. I, I would make a point that I, I often when I go down to Midland Road, it's empty. Uh, and, and it's a genuine concern there. It means that either people can't be bothered to book it online, which is a very easy system, so I, I, I don't have a problem with that. But it, I remember going there before, and it really wasn't empty. So there's something going on. There's a lot of people that live on the east side of the city that won't be asked to go to, to um, across to Canesham. And Canesham is a good facility. My concern is if we don't have a, a replacement for the time when, I, as I understand it, we give up Midland Road, because that is the plan, that there's nothing else in Bath and there's some reliance on, uh, on going all the way to Kensham. Uh, and there might be some things I'm, I'm unaware of there, but um, that's my concern. Um, as you said, there'll be no, no gap in provision. So we won't leave Midland Road, as we've repeatedly said, until there's a like-for-like -like replacement within the city of Bath. And, and your statement alluded to that. Um, there, there are lies in leaflets being distributed by your party, not in, in your ward, um, but in other wards within the, the city, as far as I know. Um, will you deplore those and call for those to stop being distributed? That's my main question. Okay, well, if you give me an example of that uh, and it shows uh, that to be an untruth or, or an unfair accusation, I will do my utmost to change that. Obviously, uh, with, within that, I understand that there were negotiations about odd down. I don't know where they are. We're not in the council. It, it, it's up to you to advertise them. And all I would genuinely ask for is, is 
to not be afraid of, of scrutiny and being pushed because together we can get the best thing for our city and indeed area. It's not just it's not just Bath. It's it's North East Somerset. So I understand there are some difficulties there, and I understand that there are some uh, dates set down for Midland Road, which might make it difficult because we don't know what's happening up the road. If that is your genuine aim, then I would fully support you in that. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Martin, for your uh, questions and speech. Uh, so moving on um, uh, to Dr. Leach next. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My comments relate to the Milson Quarter Master Plan, which is item 13 on today's agenda. For a long time, there has been a need for a safe way for pedestrians to cross Lansdowne Road at its southern extremity, to get from the western side of the Paragon to the southern side of George Street. The traffic lights at the bottom of Lansdowne Road are not pedestrian controlled, and the current phasing of lights at that junction does not provide a window for pedestrians to cross the junction safely. Able-bodied people can wait for a break in the flow of traffic and then make the dash across, but this is clearly not a solution for elderly residents or those with walking disabilities. The crossing at that junction needs to be upgraded, as the Milsom Quarter Master Plan gets implemented, the volume of pedestrian traffic needing a safe way to cross that junction will only increase. The more successful the Master Plan, the greater that need will become. Therefore, I believe the Master Plan would be a suitable means for effecting that upgrade. And I ask that the detailed planning for the implementation of the Milsom Quarter Master Plan when that is undertaken, should include the early provision of a safe and convenient pedestrian-centric crossing at that junction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Would you agree with me that, um, as, I, as I've done over the last few months, that pushing a pram with a small child in it, you take your life and your child's uh, life in their hands uh, when you are trying to cross that junction because not only do you have to drop down nearly a metre from the high pavements in Lansdowne Road, but you also have no sight line on vehicles coming round the corner from Lansdowne Road because it is so dangerous. So would you agree with me that this is really should be a very high priority for the council within the city region sustainable transport settlement for improvement to that junction most certainly i would it's been a very long time since i have pushed children in a yeah it's been a long time since i have pushed any children in a small stroller but yes i, I certainly agree that uh, the sight lines and the provision at that junction um, is not adequate for people who are not able to dash across the road and um, absolutely as, as early as possible as that is currently an existing problem and will only grow worse thank you very much john for your statements uh well, moving on um mr rotherham uh, thank you. Same, same theme, actually. I'm chairman of the Vineyards Residents Association. Um, Vineyards, as most of you know, is, is the row of houses opposite the Paragon, <laughs> and it includes the Countess of Huntingdon's Chapel, the Building and Bath Museum, and uh, the Star Pub, very important uh, local site. Um, Vineyards stroke Paragon adjoins the Milsom Quarter. I mean, it's a stone's throw, literally, um, from the end of it to, to George Street. Um, and in the master plan map, we're shown as part of, of Lower Lansdowne. And I say all of this just to underline that we're part of Central Bath um, in, 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 in Vineyards. Although we're in uh, Walcott Ward, we're actually a little island cut off from the rest of the, of the ward by, by Hedgemead Park. We support the master plan. Um, it seems a very imaginative set of proposals to make a much needed improvement to uh, revive and improve the public realm of the heart of the city uh, with less traffic and better pedestrian access. Uh, Vineyards, as you've heard, is an important access route for pedestrians um, coming from the east. And the lack of a pedestrian crossing at the, at the bottom of Lansdowne is a, is a serious obstacle. I mean, I've got grandchildren, I would let them do it by themselves. Um, 
It's a dangerous crossing for pedestrians as the lights always allow traffic movement from some direction. Um, there's never a, an actual safe place to spot. You have to find your moment in a gap in the traffic and, and, and get across. So I'd strongly support um, the, the aim of including this pedestrian crossing within the context of the Milsom Street uh, master plan. Um, Milsom Quarter basically if it happens, when it happens, will be a livable neighbourhood. Um, that's something we want for Vineyards Paragon as well. There's 500 odd people live along um, Vineyards and Paragon. Um, the pedestrian crossing would be part of the uh, livable neighbourhoods process. Uh, we're pleased that some other measures that we've um, uh, talked about in the past to calm and reduce traffic have been taken up. For example, um, Sunday parking control, and the 25 mile an hour limit, which is being put in place at, at the moment. That's great. Um, we've long urged the council to reduce on-street meter parking in the central zone, basically to reduce the amount of traffic going into and driving around um, the circus area and, and indeed past us. And we've also proposed uh, resident-only parking bays on Paragon as a traffic calming measure. Um, that would enable the installation of EV charging points and also bicycle storage um, uh, areas on, 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 uh, on Paragon. And it's particularly important for Paragon because most of it's in flats and people have got nowhere to store bikes, so people don't cycle even if they, even if they want to. Um, it would help residents and also, in our view, eminently in line with the aim of uh, reducing traffic for net zero. Um, that's all. I thought I would leave to another day the issue of having a main road going through the middle of the Milsom Quarter and, and indeed the World Heritage Site. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Any questions? No. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Um, Councillor Loper. Thank you for your statement. Uh, Mr. Rollin, um, would you care to meet with me at some point in the immediate future to discuss these issues uh, as I'm the Cabinet member with responsibility for this uh, particular um, project. Uh, yes, I'd be very glad to. I'll leave okay, well, my, I'll my out details out with you. Set my meeting. Thank you. Splendid. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, moving on. Um, Mr. Bentley. Thank you, Chair. Um, Cabinet, I'm speaking on behalf of David Redwell, who is currently not very well. Firstly, I'd like to request that you send his wishes, send your wishes is to him so that I can repeat back to him um, with respect to what's happening uh, around the region. The problem of public transport is obviously not a matter that Bath Council have determining powers on, but as I know, Kevin is uh, is additionally in a responsible position within WACA. Uh, I am raising the issue about cross-border public transport provision on um, affecting both the area where I live in, in Bristol, and across here into Bath and North East Somerset, and also additionally on the corridor of routes leading up into South Gloucestershire and across the border from Wacker into Gloucestershire uh, proper. Um, there are a number of issues relating to the recent public transport cuts that have occurred within Bath and North East Somerset, particularly with the former number 178 route only partially being replaced as by either 379. I am aware from the previous meeting held of the Joint Committee at WECA uh, that there are already steps taking place to get, uh, to, to get license provision at that level of for services <coughs> is to Poulton, Radstock and Midsummer Norton, and which do need to be reflected and which will give those people connectivity not only to Bath but also into South and East Bristol, uh, and which have been heavily cut and which has created a significant public transport black hole of, of affecting a large number of very isolated communities within that region. I would like to emphasize the point that these 
areas are areas I myself have previously lived in. I am a former resident of Wansdyke constituency a, a myself, and I additionally also lived in the South Bristol Corridor around Whitchurch Village, it's close close to Stockwood, but on your side of the border. Uh, uh, these issues are affecting not just Bath and North East Somerset, they are also affecting South Gloucestershire, and they are also affecting the area I live in within inner city Bristol in St Paul's. Also, these are issues which are blighting some of the most deprived people in our regions, people who cannot afford to drive cars, and it's even less affordable both here in Bath, and it very soon will be in Bristol too, who with the soon to who be happening introduction of our own clean air zone. And I want to raise the point that Bath does have a role to play within WECA, and I would like you to ensure that all steps are taken with respect to, to us having an effective if public transport provision across this region. Thank you very much, Cabinet. Mm, thank you very much, Robert. Is, is any questions from you? Councillor Ball? Yes, can you please send our best wishes back to David? He's been well known as chamber for many years. He's come here unwell quite often. And we do know he, he, he travels by public transport everywhere. I used to dread getting caught on a train back from West Liverpool several times because he would talk to me all the way back. But we do respect the work he's done. And he emailed us yesterday, I mean, we're sick now, we do appreciate his work. Will you please give my best wishes? Yes, of course I will. I will follow up at, uh, this with a conversation with him later this evening or tomorrow. Thank you, Robert. Yes, definitely pass on our best wishes to David, and thank you for that. Uh, okay, um, next we have uh, Saskia. Hello. Um, good evening, my name is Saskia Helges. About a year ago I gave a statement at full council and my message at the time was one of hope and a call to be bold. I asked the council to stick to their mandate and to deliver the safe cycling route that they promised to school children. As bicycle mayor of Bath and as a mum, I'm very disappointed by the outcome of the citizens panel on active travel. I'm disappointed about the fact you called for a citizens panel in the first place. It is your duty as elected representatives to make decisions in everyone's best interests. The citizens panel didn't have the same expertise and knowledge as you do. From the panel's report, it seems that members of the panel were not educated about government's guidelines, including cycle infrastructure design guidance LTN 120 and gear change, for example. I believe this knowledge was essential to be able to make an informed decision about active travel schemes. As an aside, I also believe it was the wrong decision to exclude secondary school children to take part in the citizens panel. A 16-year-old could have taken part in the process and would have offered a different viewpoint from all the participants. This is especially important because this citizens panel was about an active travel route to secondary schools. Uh, prioritising active travel infrastructure on flat routes only doesn't make any sense because we all know many places can't be reached without going up a hill in Bath. For example, most of Bath's secondary schools are located on hills. Uh, the citizens panel is supposed to be about guiding principles for active travel design and about deciding which route would be best for an active travel route to Cleverton Down. I won't be commenting on the guiding principles, but there was no recommendation on which route would be best. Instead, one of the recommendations discussed tonight is for a future project to revisit all options for traffic reduction from the valley floor to Cleverton Down. This will set us back years. We don't have time for this. This will set us back even further than when we were after the bus gate on North Road wasn't installed as a trial. Children are unsafe cycling up that hill now. Parents are not letting their children cycle to school now because they believe it is unsafe for them to cycle. Children are being driven to school now, and children will be, still be driven to school in two years' time, five years' time, eight years' time, when it is 2030. The year when the council wants to see a 24 reduction in road miles driven, and the year my seven-year-old will be sitting her GCSEs exams. To reach this reduction in driving, we will have to enable people to change the way they travel for short journeys. We need to make it as inviting as we can for people to take this step. I very much welcome the council introducing 20 miles per hour speed limits on all three routes up to Cleverton Down. The only way to create a safe active travel route between the city centre and the Cleverton Down is to introduce a model filter on one of the roads going up the hill. Please don't postpone this any longer. Thank you, Chelsea, for your comments. Any questions? No? Thank you very much. 
Right, move on to Councillor Furs, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, right, um, my first question is about the Jiangxi province and uh, Xinjiang city friendship agreement. Um, in view of the UN report released on the 1st of September on human rights concerns in the Xinjiang Uyghur region in China, surely it's time we ceased our friendship agreement with this province. Uh, the creation of such a friendship agreement with Jiangxi um, approximately 45 million people several years ago was at a time when the PRC was considered to be respecting the freedoms of its people, respecting the international agreements in Hong Kong, and not showing any aggression in the region. Over that, over, however, over time, we have seen our agreement in place. There has been political suppression and breaking of the international agreements in Hong Kong, expansionism in the South China Sea, serious military threats to democratic Taiwan, and now the United Nations report on human rights abuses with the Uyghur population, specifically in Xinjiang region. Furthermore, at local level, there has been no news of this friendship agreement from either the cabinet or council officers for a long time, and no known economic benefit to Bath and North East Somerset. Corresponding with, um, in my correspondence with council directors and economic development officers recently, they have confirmed that there hasn't been any involvement in this for about six to seven years since John Wilkinson was head of economic development. So there is no value or benefit in the relationship anyway to us. So on the face of it, it would appear to be um, defunct and retaining such an agreement gives tacit support to Xianzi province and therefore the Chinese Communist Party and its human rights abuses of Uyghurs, oppression of Hong Kong, and threats to democratic Taiwan. I am advised by council officers this is now a council decision, so I therefore call on cabinet to cease the funding of this friendship agreement, which I believe there has been no funding in recent years anyway, uh, and support my motion to council next week. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor First. Any questions for Councillor First? No. Uh, I, I would like to say I, I fully agree with the statement that you've made, Councillor Furs, and I look forward to you bringing it up as a motion at, uh, for Council next week. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. And I've got this, my second question here. Apologies for two for the price of one. Um, save our railway ticket offices. <clears throat> Earlier this year, the government amended its guidance to train operators regarding ticket offices. Therefore, all of England's 980 staffed rail ticket offices could be under threat of closure following comments from the then Transport Minister Grant Shapps and the Railway Delivery Group that represents train operators. 12% yeah. of all rail tickets in England are still purchased at staffed ticket offices. Ticket office closure will disproportionately affect elderly and disabled residents alongside those who may not know how to select the most appropriate journey options to keep the fair prices down. We all, we've all had difficulty in selecting a rail ticket, I'm sure. Yeah. Even the elderly who do not use the internet, many of the elderly who do use the internet, many are not confident about making payments online. So although they can select and work out what they're doing, they won't necessarily use their credit cards online, which is understandable. Age UK estimate that 3 million elderly people in the UK do not have access to the internet, and many more do not have mobile, a mobile device. Ticket office staff at Bath are employed by GWR trains, and the very existence of this ticket office in Bath is under threat. I therefore ask Cabinet to raise the following concerns with the new Secretary of State, and I've had to cross a few out here, um, Mr Chairman, since, since I first brought this up, because it was Grant Shapps when I first wrote to it. When I was due here um, uh, last month, it was meant to be Anne-Marie Trevelyan, but now it's Mark Harper, who's just down the road in the Forest of Dean. But we need to keep up with this, because if we don't act quickly, we'll be writing to the wrong person <coughs> and our local MP. So, um, <clears throat> to the effect that not all residents are able to use ticket uh, station, <clears throat> excuse me, station ticket machines or have the means to book a, a ticket in advance, and not all who do use the internet are not confident about making payments online. Complicated journeys involving connections are likely to require human assistance to ensure customers purchase the most appropriate and cheapest tickets and do not incur penalties for missed book tickets. I think that is a big issue. Uh, and closure of our ticket office will disproportionately affect the elderly and disabled. Uh, and Bath Railway Station, with approximately 6 million passengers in a normal year, serves not only its residents but a vast number of foreign visitors, and this is one of their primary interfaces with the UK public transport system. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councillor First. Councillor Ball. 
Yes, thank you, Councillor Burns. Can you be confident enough that the Cabinet member in post at the moment will be there long enough to answer the question? <laughs> I, I'm sure the Cabinet member will be in post long enough. I'm, I'm the Secretary of State, I don't know. The jury's still out. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Rigby, please. Uh, thank you. Um, would you agree with me, Councillor Furs, that uh, it's not just about the selling of tickets that make a ticket office really valuable. It's about the fact that they can help if there's a medical emergency. They can help, as you say, be the first interface with people when we've got big bath rugby matches, as an example. Um, their role is being a human interface, so it's not just about the transactional ticket. That what we actually are, what, what we don't want to lose is the fact that, as a tourist um, city, uh, and also for our own residents, that we have that capacity to react in a human way when events don't necessarily go as planned. I, I, I totally agree with that. And the human interface is more than somebody standing by the ticket machine, which is my fear that GWR or the other train operators will say, oh, we've got a human dealing with the public at ticket machines. Because we all know when we've got complicated journeys, you know, and I, and I, I have many complicated journeys, that I want to get the right connection, the right ticket, go via, go via the right routes to, do, to break the journeys when I want to do. And the ticket machine, no matter how the human interface person standing there helping you, it just won't do that. So I agree with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Furs. I will happily write to the Secretary of State. I have put Mark's name down in pencil, though, just in case. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Cabinet, following a previous approach made to you this evening, I very appropriately address you tonight with serious concerns about the future of waste and recycling services in Baines. According to a Cabinet report from July 2021, the Midland Road F Waste Facility is scheduled to close in July 2023. That is in just 10 months' time. Not to worry, one might suppose, because the same Cabinet report helpfully identifies an alternative site, the one at Oddown, currently owned by Waste Recycling Bath. The report states, and I quote, the previous option assessments only points to a single location suitable for a permanent relocation of a full replacement for Midland Road facility at Oddown. In July this year, however, in an email to the Managing Director of Waste Recycling Bath, Councillor Wood confirmed that the decision had not yet been made on whether or not Oddown site will replace Midland Road. I understand that evaluation exercises are currently being carried out on the Oddown site with feasibility work and technical surveys to be undertaken later. I welcome these studies. It's it is indeed important that the Council is delivering value for money for residents. You may have previously given assurances that Midland Road will not close until an alternative site is found. This, too, is welcome, but it's contrary to the wording of the July 2021 Cabinet report, which makes it clear that Midland Road will close in July 2023. Can you therefore tonight reassure residents that the Midland Road facility will not close until an alternative like for night facility is not only identified but fully operational? And if so, can you issue some communications to clear up any confusion and anxieties uh, residents may have? The decision to progress with finding an alternative to the Midland Road site was made in January 2019, yet here we are, more than three years later, and no decision has been made despite the fact that an alternative to Midland Road is really available and has been identified as the best option by the Council. Can you please explain why this important work has been delayed? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pritchard, for your statement. Uh, questions? Councillor Wood. Uh, yeah, mainly this is, uh, this is time for a, for a question, of course, but I'll just make a very brief, brief comment on what, uh, on what you've said. Um, so, as you've identified, there is a, a, an old report, which you've quoted from, um, and in terms of public uh, statements, uh, I think at last count we've made 10 public statements through the Council's Communications Office, saying very clearly, with the same wording every single time, Midland Road will not close until 
a like-for-like -like replacement is open in the city of Bath. And I think there's been 10 press releases issued to that effect well after the historic report that you've referenced. So my question is this, do you think it's moral and ethical for your candidates in Bath to be writing articles and distributing them to voters based on out-of-date information and scaremongering about the provision of waste and recycling in Bath? So I'll just repeat the question for, for clarity. Do you think it's moral and ethical for those candidates to be doing that? Um, I'm not sure that I'm here to question my morality or my ethic, ethical background, but I have no knowledge of, of what you're uh, suggesting about uh, in, incorrect information coming out. Um, but I do have the knowledge of the information that you've been putting out in the True Valley, which is contrary to that, but by the side I took that opportunity just to say that. Um, what I would appreciate from you, Councillor Wood, is and, and accepting that you have sent, and you're very specific, that 10 uh, press releases have been released suggesting the approach that Midland Road will not close. Following this meeting, uh, could I respectfully ask that you put out the 11th uh, uh, in 11th communication to emphasise because it's evident that the message, although you've done 10, the, the message isn't coming out clear to a number of residents and just to clarify that commitment that you're making. Um, sure, I'm sure it'll be more than 11 uh, by the time we get to, to May, to be honest. Um, so, so absolutely happy to, to do that. I would, I would say that the public is clear on this um, what's muddying the water is, is lies distributed by Conservative candidates. Um, I, was a, I was a little bit worried by what you said, um, that you have no knowledge of this. There are candidates of Bath and North East Somerset Council for the Conservative Party distributing promises, pledges across Bath that the leader of the Conservatives in Bath and North East Somerset has no knowledge of. That, that worries me. Um, and will you take that up on my behalf, please? You're, you're asking me for an authoritative reply, and I can't give you it if I'm not absolutely familiar with what charges you're making, and you are making very strong charges of lying, which is libelous in itself, without substance. I would need to go and check back on that to make sure there is qualification in the charges that you're making. Thank you, Councillor Bishop. Um, I think what Councillor Wood is, is saying is that um, uh, you need to be aware of the, the wording that's on Conservative Party leaflets that's being handed out, and there is wording that suggests that the contrary to what has been st stated by the Council on numerous occasions. Uh, but we'll, we'll move on to another question. So I, I was just going to say, and I was just going to thank you for that explanation, because sometimes it's difficult to understand where a councillor was directing his charges, um, and these are serious charges of which I can counter with the, some of the publications that has been put out and received in my mailbox only yesterday. Uh, very quickly, um, Councillor Samuel, please, and then we'll move on. Um, well, we, we all know about the Conservative Party's um, skill in disinformation, but are you aware that when you visit the recycling centre, there is a massive sign that says, this centre will not close until a replacement in Bath has been found. You cannot miss it. You'd have to be blind, but then maybe some of your members are. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm aware Councillor Jackson is, is asking to ask questions. Unfortunately, Councillor Jackson has been given advice that only cabinet members can ask questions of, of people who are making statements, so I apologise for that. But those are the rules. Yeah. Well, Freddie, it wasn't really to do directly with the question, Chair, but to do with the fact that the marketing department has put out a statement which is not accurate, so possibly uh, Councillor Pritchard was right to be sceptical. Uh, this statement came out at the beginning of the weeks and omits the Remembrance Day celebrations in Radstock and Westfield. And this is very serious, and I would hope, Chair, you would want to apologise for what marketing and comms have done. And, uh, and that, of course, then puts a question mark over all the other statements they put out. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, we, we did digress there. I, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Thank you very much for your statement, Councillor Pritchard. Moving on to Councillor David. Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, so my statement is with regard to the development update on land to the rear of 189 to 123 English Coombe Lane in Morlands Ward. This site has a long history of proposed developments and Cabinet will be aware of the concerns that have been raised by community members and myself about this site. I am grateful that the previous plans for this site were scrapped. These relied on an untested scheme to recreate and translocate habitat on a separate site which was unrelated to the field or local community. This green field is part of a wider stretch of green space that runs from Bloomfield Road towards Rush Hill and the Green Belt. The wider area includes woodland as well as the property of Sturtingale Farm in Oddown, and this green corridor is an important asset both to the character of the city as well as a home for wildlife. I want to put on record that I and a number of residents have strong concerns over the appropriateness of this site for any development. We are concerned about the ecological features of the site species and habitats, but also the impact of any development on the local springs and land stability. These are all features of the site before the specifics of any design or access arrangements are considered. I know these issues are familiar to Cabinet members and I want to thank Councillor Tom Davies, uh, Councillor Kevin Guy and Councillor Dina Romero for the time they have taken to speak with and listen to residents about this site. Over the last six or seven months, Councillor Tom Davies has met twice with residents to discuss the background and business case to these current proposals, and I am very grateful for his openness and honesty. Uh, the paper ahead of you later this evening proposes to allocate a substantial sum of money to further project work and investigations on the site. Uh, my ask of you this evening, uh, on behalf of residents, is that the administration continues with the open approach that is shown so far, and provides details of the scope and focus of the technical studies that will be carried out to assess the site and shares the findings and engages with residents before a decision is made to proceed to draw up a planning application. And furthermore, if the findings of these technical surveys and studies suggest that development is inappropriate for any reason, whether environmental or financial, remove this plan as an allocated site from the housing development in the current local plan. I note that the paper includes a reference to the Building with Nature standards, and I welcome this as any development should seek to protect and enhance green infrastructure. The Building with Nature standards framework provides uh, a basis for good development and a means for independent assessment separate from the Council, and I hope that this is something we will look at applying more widely in the next local plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, questions? Yes, Councillor Davies. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor David, for your, for your statement. Uh, Councillor David, you've done a huge amount to date to represent your residents who have got concerns about this site, as you yourself um, share in a number of areas. Uh, are you happy as we go forward in line with the paper later on today's suggestions, are you happy to continue to be the main point of contact for the council to represent uh, those local residents who have concerns on the site as we go forward? Yes, of course, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jess. Thank you. Okay, uh, that concludes that section of the meeting. So we'll move on to the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, I invite cabinet members uh, to say they are a true record of the previous meeting. A show of hands if they're a true record, please. Good, I'll sign them now. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to thank all the speakers for their time as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Uh, item number nine, consideration of single member items. And I request there are none. So item number 10, consideration of matters referred to by policy development scrutiny bodies. I'll invite uh, Councillor Pritchard to present uh, for the Children, Adults and Health and Wellbeing PDS panel. Councillor Pritchard, please. Yes, I have an item, Chairman, for you from the... Uh, with regard to the RUH Ambulance Service Winter Planning Treatment Waiting Times. And at its last meeting on the 19th of October, the Children, Adults, Health and Wellbeing Policy Development and Scrutiny Panel received an update on the current challenges faced by the RUH, particularly in respect of admissions and discharge. Members were told that the situation is extremely complex with no obvious single solution. The importance of social care was emphasised by health partners with effective domiciliary and reablement services key to enabling throughput from the hospital. 
The panel welcomed this partnership work taking place between the Council and the RUH in developing its own home care provision. However, members noted that the retention within the social care is particularly challenging with staff leaving to work in other sectors such as retail. With this in mind, the panel resolved to write to the Integrated Care Partnership to emphasise the importance of remuneration across the sector, particularly when considering the impact retention has on our acute hospital. Cabinet is asked to support the initiatives that lead to the retention of Bain's social care professionals across the district and look to ensure that this commitment is reflected in the developing of the Integrated Care Partnership strategy. Thank you, Councillor Pritchard. Um, any comments, any questions? No, thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna drag myself back down the agenda. There's a second set of minutes for the for the Thursday, the eighth of September, because we didn't get round to signing these because of the tragic death of Her Majesty. Uh, can I have a show of hands that they, they are a, a true record, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> right, okay, moving on. Uh, so item 11, recent single member decisions. Ask the Cabinet to note those, please. Uh, item number 12, the valley floor to Claverton Down Cycle Road. I'd like to welcome Lucy Bush. Welcome to the meeting, and I know you've travelled from, from London. Big smoke all the way to Little Bar. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, you, you're going to give us a 10 to 15 minute presentation, is that right? That's right. Please, the, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me this evening. Uh, my, name is, my, my name is up there. I'm Lucy Bush. I'm a research director at Britain Thinks. And I'm here to talk about the citizens panel um, that we ran for the council. Um, it's a summary report. There's a very detailed report that sits behind this. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions after my presentation. I have a couple of slides that uh, just run through what we did and who we spoke to. Um, then there are sort of five key findings that I will talk through. Um, then I have the principles um, that our panelists um, devised, guidelines, recommendations for how the council would go about um, bringing in active travel schemes in the future. Uh, and then some final conclusions and recommendations uh, at the end of the, the project that we, um, that we recommended to the council. Um, so we were commissioned to run a, an exercise in deliberative engagement or deliberative consultation um, around the topic of active travel schemes uh, in this area. Um, we did talk about some specific locations, um, but we didn't, um, uh, we didn't ask participants to rate specific schemes against one another or vote in any kind of hard and fast way. But we did talk, we did talk about uh, the Claverton Down area and um, there were some specific views on uh, bringing in active travel schemes uh, in that area. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please, thank you. Uh, this is an overview of what we did. Uh, lots of words on there, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through um, um, the process. Um, before we actually started the deliberative uh, engagement, we conducted a call for evidence. Um, this was hosted by um, ourselves at Britain Thinks, but marketed and publicised by the council. Uh, and the idea was to ensure that a wider audience, um, res you know, residents, local groups, businesses were able to share their views and put them um, forward at the very start of the process. Uh, there were sort of four questions that we put out to, to um, in the call for evidence, um, and 733 responses were um, were collected. They were thematically analysed, and um, and we fed some of those views into the uh, into the panel for for their review. Uh, in terms of the deliberative engagement itself, um, it was all conducted remotely. Um, we started the process with a 30-minute launch event online with all the panellists, um, and then we had a series of four sort of focus groups, 90-minute discussion sessions, where we really understood where people were starting from and their um, current existing concerns about uh, travel and transport in the area. We supplemented that with uh, some in-depth telephone interviews, uh, three of those with harder-to-reach residents. Um, they were 
um, defined as people who might find it difficult to take part in an online uh, engagement um, or perhaps find it difficult in, for other reasons to take part in a group discussion. Um, and, they, and they ran alongside the kind of the, the, uh, the field work throughout. Um, that was the initial sort of launch and the initial uh, discussion groups. We then onboarded everybody onto uh, an online community platform or sort of a digital platform, um, which is a closed platform. It's not, it's not publicly open. Um, and uh, in that space, we shared some information with the panelists. We gave them some time and space to reflect on their views um, and think about various um, options for active travel. Uh, and then the, the most sub sort of substantive part of the program is when we brought those participants into deliberation sessions. Uh, so these are slightly longer groups um, where we asked people to reflect on the things that they had been shown and learned about on the online community platform and were given the opportunity to, uh, to weigh up in discussion with others um, their views on, um, on some of those issues. Uh, so that's sort of an overview of the methodology. Uh, in terms of the sample, that is who we spoke to, there were 27 panellists in total, and that includes the three hard-to-reach uh, residents that I mentioned. Um, all were resident, local residents of Bath and North East Somerset. That was obviously a, um, a, a fundamental criteria for them being um, on the panel. Um, and they interacted with routes between the Claverton Down Plateau and Bath City, City Centre with varying levels of regularity. We made sure that some people were using those routes very, very frequently and some um, less frequently in order to get a mix um, across the panel. And we also had um, a mix of typical modes of transport represented as well. Um, there's, there's some detail on the right-hand side um, which demonstrates the, the, um, the diversity of the panel, um, but I won't go into detail here. You can, you can um, see that um, on the screen. Um, thank you. If you can move on to the next slide. Okay, so I have here then the sort of the five key findings. There is a lot of detail that sits behind all of these, but um, I will run through the, uh, the, the sort of the top-line findings. First key finding is that when we ask people uh, an open question, tell me about travel and transport in your local area, the concerns that come up spontaneously, uh, the top of mind concerns are usually related to congestion on the roads. They're about, the problems are related to cars. Um, that's people who use cars. They talk about, they, they find it stressful and other issues to do with parking that make it um, unpleasant. Um, and it's also from the point of view of pedestrians or people cycling. So car travel is, is the, the sort of the go-to issue that people start talking about when you ask them an open question. Um, poor public transport options um, is a close second um, in terms of um, bus provision especially. Um, active travel infrastructure, the lack of it, is actually something that doesn't come up spontaneously um, in the same way. Uh, so people don't immediately start to say, oh, but there aren't cycle routes. That doesn't initially come into the conversation. When, it, when prompted, when you say, what do you think about cycle routes or, or so on, um, then it is recognised and people do sort of think, yes, that, that is an issue, but it's not, it's not as top of mind, as I say, um, as issues related to congestion or poor public transport. Um, just moving on to the sec uh, next slide, please, um, which is the second key finding. There is a, I should just um, also point out there are some quotes at the bottom of each of these slides um, which are from the panellists just sort of um, highlighting uh, or reinforcing the, the key finding on the slide. It's frozen. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the second uh, second is. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just trying to remember what the second uh, second key finding is. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, 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 the, so, the, so the starting point is that people don't think about active travel. Then, building on from that, um, we found that our panelists were very open to um, to active travel. Um, and are positive about its benefits. They're usually looking at it through the lens, a personal lens, that is, um, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that yes, that's perfect, thank you. 
um, they're usually thinking about it through a personal lens, that is um, mental or physical health benefits, environmental benefits in terms of um, um, reduced air pollution. Um, and we heard a lot of you know, our panellists talking about that they would like to walk more, cycle more, um, but they, they find that there are barriers in terms of not feeling fit enough, um, perhaps not feeling mobile enough, and, and certainly there were people in our ensemble who, um, who were wheelchair users or um, had long-term health conditions. Uh, and concerns about not feeling safe enough as well. So these were all barriers that, that um, our panellists talked about, and thinking um, especially about the local geography um, concerns around moving up and down steep hills. Um, I can't... If you just want... Yeah, there you go. That's fine, thanks. Um, so we found that residents were also broadly positive about bringing in some specific active travel interventions in the area. Um, we tested ideas like improving pedestrian crossings, um, bringing in more um, bike, bicycle parking facilities, those types of ideas. Um, and there is warmth and openness to them, and people can see the benefits um, to their local area. However, there are also sticking points about the impact that those types of schemes would have on motorists in terms of making space on the road. That is part, a part of the conversation. People say, yes, I like that idea, but I also am concerned that it would have an impact on... Um, my ability to park near where I live, for example. Um, we weren't able to resolve that, that contradiction um, through this discussion. Um, the fourth uh, key finding here, um, so this is in relation to the active travel schemes in the Claverton Down area. Um, there essentially were concerns about um, the council being able to encourage uh, someone like them, they're thinking about it from their perspective, to travel up and down such a steep hill. And they look at that gradient and they say it feels too steep for people of sort of normal levels of fitness to, to use on a regular basis. They're worried about um, uh, the idea that, that they would sort of, yeah, they would not be able to, uh, to manage that. That's the starting point. However, um, there is evidence to suggest that um, the residents do support an active travel route up one of the roads on the hill. As I say, we didn't pit the ideas against one another or ask them to vote in a hard and fast way, but when they're looking at that area and they're thinking about the fact there are three roads there, they do say that, yes, um, I would support the, an active travel route on, on one of those roads to make it feel safer um, uh, and to encourage people to, to cycle there. Um, and they also talked about um, provision of e-bikes. Um, uh, the, there's a quote on the bottom there which actually is talking about an e-bike hire scheme or something where you wouldn't have to purchase an e-bike yourself um, that they felt would make travelling up steep hills uh, much easier and more achievable for normal people. That's uh, in sort of inverted commas. Okay, so those are the five key findings. Um, what I have here, and in fact, you can move on to the next slide, um, are the four... Um, uh, residents' principles um, that they devised to sort of guide or inform decision making on active travel schemes. Um, there is detail sitting behind these in the full report, but essentially they are firstly to offer an easy and appealing alternative to short car journeys. Um, our panellists wanted those uh, active travel schemes, such as cycling, um, uh, cycling routes, to be a, a, an easy replacement for a car journey, either ones that, that there are lots of short car journeys happening along that route, um, or that they could imagine very easily, um, as easily as possible, swapping out a car journey for um, a, a walk or a cycle. Um, and that's where the kind of the preference for a flat road came in. Um, secondly, having clear and effective safety features. This was especially important for our panelists who are not currently cyclists. Um, and found the idea of cycling on the roads very daunting. They would like to make sure that uh, anything um, brought in would, would you know, ensure their safety and uh, have safety features. Uh, the third principle is about being connected and integrated into the wider transport network in terms of um, making sure that cycling routes don't just stop and you have to dismount your, um, um, and that you're able to sort of get onto a bus or get onto public transport um, from, your, from walking or from your bike. Um, Fourth and final principle here is being careful not to disadvantage those who can't easily choose active travel. Um, this was a, an important principle from our panellists, um, that they wanted to make sure that, yes, active travel should be encouraged, but and there are clearly benefits um, to individuals and to the local area, but that those who, for, the, for whom active travel is not an option, uh, that those, those people shouldn't be disadvantaged. So that was um, uh, an important principle. 
Okay, final conclusions and recommendations uh, that we made out of the back of um, this exercise. Um, firstly, we concluded that there are clearly opportunities to progress an active travel strategy um, with public support um, because essentially people are readily and easily identifying a number of issues with private car use uh, and they're aware that they contribute to carbon emissions and climate change um, so that there are issues um, that resonate with residents already. Um, but to the point that active travel, consideration of active travel and active travel infrastructure is not top of mind, we recommended that more could be done to foreground active travel as um, a potential solution or one solution to the travel problems they're experiencing. Um, when you ask them, people tend to think about ways that driving or public transport could be improved uh, and they don't tend to go to active travel. So there's more to do to sort of raise the profile of that. Um, the third thing, uh, talking about active travel as a means um, to reducing carbon emissions is unlikely to be enough to encourage people to make the switch. It's much more powerful to talk about personal benefits to lifestyle, health and local environment. Um, a step change, the fourth one here, a step change in public transport provision is also likely to be needed to accompany a move away, away from cars um, and enable easy modal switches en route, um, e.g. buses that can hold bikes. And then final slide here. Um, concluded that sort of a, a widespread uptake of active travel is as much about a mindset shift as anything else and the need to bring uh, residents along with you as part of the solution um, and um, just flagging that basically debates, we were <laughs> unsurprisingly unable to resolve debates about, um, about road space, um, but you know, able to sort of flesh those out a little bit. Um, the sixth point here is about just the need to proactively support and reassure those who are anxious, scared or less able or unable to travel actively. We found that that personal ambivalence or a feeling of being excluded actually can lead to anger and rejection, even if there are personal benefits to be had. And um, uh, MTF felt like that was an important um, conclusion to draw out from this. And then finally, um, Many uh, in, in our panel certainly were open to travelling more actively, but really nervous about doing so, especially around cycling. Um, and um, and there's, the infrastructure that's required and the safety features that are required um, are asked for or called for by the panellists in order to, sort of, to help them make that first step um, and to encourage them to, to travel more actively. That's the final slide. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, I'm going to look for questions. We have time for, for, for four questions. But it's, a, it's really interesting. So uh, as, a, as a councillor, you often get the views of people that are very, very engaged in particular topics, and they have very strong opinions on them. So it's, it's really interesting to find out the opinions of people who, who are not particularly wrapped up with the topic. So thank you for that. It's very interesting. I'm going to look for questions. I've got uh, Councillor Romero first, and then Councillor Warren. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for the work that you have done on this and for talking us through through that so, so clearly. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts were about the inclusion of the voice of, uh, of children in mm. this type of exercise and whether you know, either a, a separate piece of work should be done to, so that this is uh, fully reflective of all of the uh, users of... Um, of, of the, those routes um, going from the valley floor up to Cleverton Down? Uh, I think that including the voices of young people and children would be really valuable and, very, and is very important. They are also um, potential users of active travel um, and I think they would have uh, an important contribution to make. Um, running a deliberative engagement programme like this with younger people um, requires a slightly different approach. Um, I mean, firstly, it's quite difficult to mix up groups of younger and people and, and adults um, in, into group discussions, so you'd have to sort of run separate research. And within, within this particular budget, we focused on the adult population as a kind of a starting point. Um, and I think that was a sensible and right decision to get a good, robust readout from um, a, a representative group of um, adults. Having said that, I do agree with you that there would be much value in speaking to younger people and children. Thank you so much, Lucy, for, um, for all your work and for coming to tell us about it this evening. I just wondered how you think um, using an approach like this, um, how it adds to or differs from um, 
more traditional council approaches um, like using you know quantitative yeah. um, methods or um, you know our traditional sort of surveys yeah uh, I think there are probably two key things and and, um, and uh, Kevin you picked up on, on one which is that um, in this approach you actually speak to um, a group of people who have no particular vested interest or axe to grind or they've perhaps never even thought about this thing before um, they are in that sense more representative of a kind of typical resident or layperson um, and you get sort of a, a, a more balanced view that people don't have entrenched kind of um, loyalties or um, or perspectives um, and I think that actually the council benefits greatly from hearing um, that more sort of balanced and slightly more detached actually um, kind of conversation uh, and um, yeah I think that's probably the, the, the key thing um, the yeah and the second thing would just be that it enables you to actually get much more detail and nuance from residents you know if you're just doing a simple survey you don't you get yes an indication of what people think but this this process really allows you to get under the surface and and challenge people and question them and sort of say why do you think that and and they have to sort of you know respond to you and um and um, and articulate their their perspective and i think that gives you a much more robust kind of um uh, set of outcomes that you can trust and, and work with Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Okay. Really okay. Thanks. So we're going to um, move to the actual paper. Thanks, Lucy. So, Cabinet, transport currently accounts for around 29% of transport emissions, of um, carbon emissions in Bath and North East Somerset. Um, ensuring the transport network can enable residents to um, move to more sustainable modes of transport um, is an essential part of our journey to net zero strategy. A move to more active travel modes will reduce congestion and pollution in our district as well as improving public health through increasing physical activity um, as we build it into our daily routines. As our first venture into the de deliberative democracy in Bath and North East Somerset, this groundbreaking piece of work provides the most detailed assessment yet of the considered views of active travel and of active travel infrastructure of a representative group of our residents, as we've heard. It gives us a snapshot of what our communities think right now about how best to balance the interests of different users of our roads. And it gives us important information about where we need to focus our communication and public engagement efforts to best support the changes in travel culture that we aim to facilitate. I think the findings can give us a lot of confidence as a cabinet that when we ask ordinary people, they agree that we should improve cycle and walking infrastructure, both for environmental but more importantly for health reasons but also that we need to do more to engage them in the fact that active travel is part of the solution to congestion, as well as to introduce more of them to the transformative nature of e-bikes and e-scooters in tackling our hills. The report is well worth a read in full, as it provides valuable, detailed insights into the aspirations and concerns about travel of residents from all walks of life, and delivers in a new way on another of our administration's priorities around giving our communities a bigger say. The use of this technique, in addition to the other consultation methods that we often use, has meant that we have heard in depth from people who aren't transport campaigners and who don't have strong views about travel that we often hear expressed here at the Council. The panel has given us principles for decision making when it comes to fitting active travel infrastructure onto our narrow roads, and I want to thank them for that advice, which we will explicitly incorporate into our decision-making frameworks in future. It will assist us in designing infrastructure that provides practical and attractive alternatives to the car for more people, more of the time. 
Cabinet, you will remember, though, that this particular piece of work came about as a result of controversy around a proposal we considered in 2021 to install a bus gate on North Road. We decided at that time that rather than go straight ahead with a controversial road closure, we would ask residents for their views in the form of this citizens' panel. While supportive of the need for infrastructure up the hill, the panel have suggested that in the first instance, the locations that may deliver the greatest increase in uptake of active travel may be along flatter routes. We are currently constructing safe segregated cycle lanes on Beckford Road and Upper Bristol Road, but there is a need for safe cycling on all of our roads. So there is huge opportunity around the whole district still to extend provision for walking and cycling in a joined up way without bringing forward these particular routes at this time. We are very ambitious in this area and determined to bring forward more schemes of this sort. At the Council, we are constantly working on initiatives aimed at providing practical alternatives to the car, including up our steep hills. For instance, since the Citizens' Panel met in spring, our e-scooter trial has been extended to include access to Bath University via Widcombe Hill, and it has also been announced that the scope of the e-scooter trial will soon be extended to include e-bike hire as well. Both of these exciting developments have the effect of making these hill-flattening technologies available to residents who might not otherwise seek them out or be able to afford them. We've just announced the introduction of 20 mile an hour speed limits on all three of these hills, Barthwick Hill, um, North Road and Wickham Hill, and we have other plans in the pipeline aimed at promoting the use of alternatives to the car when accessing Claverton Down and the Plateau. These routes remain key strategic elements of an integrated and connected Bath cycle network, even if we are not taking the decision to bring them forward for fully seg segregated cycle infrastructure today. We will, however, now accelerate our previously consulted plans for safety measures to support safer walking and cycling on Widcombe Hill and around the plateau at Claverton Down, and we will consider a future piece of work with residents to consider how best to support alternatives to car use in the area in the round. Finally, I want to take this opportunity to thank first the 27 local people who gave up several hours of their valuable time as panel members and gave the topic their serious and considered attention. As well as the local people who were kind enough to act as witnesses for them and to pass on their detailed evidence of their experience of Claverton Down. I want to thank the over 700 residents who responded to the call for evidence. To thank Lucy Bush and her highly qualified team at Britain Thinks for carrying out the work. And finally, Council Officer Dave Dixon, who provided our liaison with Lucy's team. I move the recommendations as in the report. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Uh, a second, Councillor Whitby. Thank you, Chair. As evidenced by the response given earlier to a Councillor question to Cabinet, opinion was divided down the middle on the original proposal put forward for a scheme on North Road. Those who were passionate about cycling provision being made immediately available on the route were in conflict with those who would be hugely disadvantaged by this proposal. Those who believed that this would be a well-used route if provided were in conflict with those who looked at the current data of bike usage and believed Widcombe Hill would continue to be the hill of choice. Those who felt there would be little traffic displacement onto Cleveland Walk and Bathwick Hill if the North Road proposal went ahead those who feared that the circa 4K journeys would all go on to Bathwick Hill would be in conflict with those who believed that it wouldn't, and also that traffic would be in conflict with the very few frequent student buses. The word I've used, so much, used most so far is conflict, and the second most used word is opinion. And there's the rub. The opinions we were all hearing were that of all those with direct skin in the game, very fixed views leading to head-on conflict. But what did the general public, in old parlance, the man on the Clapham omnibus, what did they think of the issue? As Lib Dems, we have said that we were very keen to explore different ways of engaging with our community and hearing their opinions. It was suggested that this might be a good topic for our citizens panel. This suggestion was backed by all four of the Whitcomb and Lincoln and Bathwick councillors whose wards this most directly affected. We've heard now from Britain Thinks how this was done, how our panel was selected, and how they were representative of our community. And before us, we have the output of their deliberations. I've actually heard some comments already about how this was a waste of money and told us nothing new. 
This is just not true. Compared to a full public consultation, this was very good value financially. And in terms of giving a clear steer about the principles underlying how we do schemes like this in the future, that was invaluable. So whilst those very, very keen and confident cyclists may have thought that those less keen and confident would be okay to start off by using the steep hills, the general opinion expressed by the panel was that starting on the flatter routes is the best way to go. Those who also saw no value in active travel and remain thinking that the car is king under all circumstances are having their views challenged massively as the majority absolutely want more cycling and walking provision when it comes to allocating out our very scarce highways resource. I also expect I've been slightly more irritating than usual in that as long as I've been on cabinet, I've been saying that a key limiter of uptake of more cycling will be the lack of provision of secure storage. And that's also what the panel said. People living in flats won't invest in a bike if they have nowhere to store it at home, no matter how many millions we spend on other infrastructure. And that is even more the case when it comes to valuable e-bikes. I know that I personally ask weekly for progress on the Sydney Building's bike hangar, uh, and I hope I haven't been too unbearable about it. I am delighted to second this motion. My personal view is that what was being proposed on North Road was not the right thing to do, was the wrong scheme in the wrong place at this time. And although a lot of misinformation was put out about it into the general public, which caused more confusion, the panel selected by Britain Thinks heard the truth and came up with the right recommendations for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rigby. I shall open up for debate. I have Councillor Paul and Councillor Samuel. Councillor Paul first. Thank you. I have lived on Wickham Hill for almost 30 years. It's the most direct route between the university and most of the student accommodation, and growing numbers of cyclists and pedestrians use it on a daily basis. The advent of the e-bike has increased the number of cyclists considerably, as you no longer need to be super fit to get up the hill, even I can. Local residents are concerned that this increasing number of cyclists and pedestrians are sharing a steep, narrow road with fast-moving traffic, and there has been a long-standing community campaign to improve safety on the hill. The proposal to make North Road the active travel route was perplexing, as it is a very indirect route for the majority of students, and as North Road hosts entrances to King Edward's School, the Golf Club and the University, significant numbers of vehicles would continue to use it, but would be forced onto longer routes with more traffic on Bathwick Hill. As has been mentioned, the public response to the North Road proposal suggested that many shared these concerns, but there were also strong views in, in favour of fairer and safer access for cyclists to the road network. Seeing the North Road proposal as a step towards reducing car dominance in the city. This was clearly a divisive and contentious issue, with strong views felt by stakeholders, and the decision to set up an independent citizens panel to examine the evidence seemed like a sensible way forward and was supported by all four councillors in Barthwick and Whitcomb wards. This group of individuals, specifically chosen by an independent organisation to be representative of the community and because they did not have predetermined views on the outcome, have been presented with facts <coughs> and opinions and have made recommendations based on that information. They conclude that there is broad support for active travel, for the health benefits it brings, and for the impact it has on our road network and the planet. I believe that they are right to recommend that the Council develops e-bike hire schemes and invests in infrastructure for safe cycle storage, particularly for people who live in flats or houses with no level access. These measures are essential to increasing cycling as an active travel option. They do not believe that there is ever evidence of sufficient demand for active travel to the university to justify the creation of a dedicated route at this time. I have some sympathy with that view because it would involve significant displacement of traffic and the council would be better placed to make such a change when measures such as improved hire and storage schemes have given more people access to cycling as an option. This could significantly reduce the number of car journeys but that is yet to happen. In the meantime, I'm pleased that the 20 mile an hour speed limits are being placed on each of the principal routes to the university. 
and that funding has been identified for safety measures on Wickham Hill, as we need to safeguard the many cyclists and pedestrians that use it each day. The Citizens' Panel has enabled local people to examine a difficult and contentious issue and has provided informed and impartial advice to councillors, which should enable us to make better decisions in future. It has shown itself to be a useful methodology and is one that we should use again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vaughan. Uh, Councillor Sanders, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'd like to welcome this report as well as breaking new ground for the Council in terms of its public engagement. This was a very challenging commission to undertake due to the complex issues at play. And for me, what was encouraging was the high degree of recognition among the panel of the need for change whilst balancing the needs of different members of the community. The recognition that there are no single solutions easily available to the Council and that imposed solutions often fail to address the needs of likely users is an important finding. As we all know, the University Bus is a major generator of transport movements between the valley floor and Carleton, and longer term solutions will need to be designed between the University and the Council as partners. I have noticed some carping from ill informed Conservative candidates on social media about the cost of this work, which at £25,000 was modest. It is important to get these things right, and if time and money has to be spent, then so be it. In the longer term, designing transport interventions with public involvement produces better outcomes, something that that party failed to take notice when they pushed ahead with the failed path and park and ride schemes. Thank you, Samuel. Um, there are no other people wanting to talk, so I'll ask Councillor Warren to sum up, please. I'll move straight to the vote, if you wish. Yeah, happy to move straight to the vote. Okay, thank you. All in favour of the paper, please show. That is unanimous. Thank you very much, Jean. Thank you. Uh, the Milson Street Quarter is an ambitious and exciting concept in holistic regeneration, whereby this council will work in partnership with the regional authority and the private sector to bring new employment, living and retail space to the heart of Bath in a considered and sustainable way. It shows once again that this administration has a bold vision for the future of our district and that we aim to deliver on that vision. Can I congratulate the officers involved from the economic development team for their hard work to get us here, and to all those who responded to the public consultation. There were many extremely valuable inputs from residents and residents' associations, and I look forward to that continuing once we start to bring more definitive plans to the table. The consultation and engagement report is an appendix to the main report, by the way. The report makes four recommendations. In short, that we accept the 2.475 million investment fund grant from WECA to be spent over three years in line with the strategic outline business case, to note the consultation report on the master plan and endorse it with the amendments sought as part of the work on the new local plan, to delegate approval for arrangements to be established to allow surplus rental income from the old post office building and the buildings along New Bond Street that were part of the property purchase, to be ring fenced for the use of the Fashion Museum project, and finally, to explore option, options to expedite the delivery of sites in private ownership that have liability challenges or have been in long term or have been long term vacant. Acceptance of the funding will enable us to build the team we need to start to deliver the plan. The six primary interventions are outlined in 3.4. There are three substantial development projects. Firstly, Broad Street Yards, which will repurpose the car park to create workspace for SMEs and startups, targeted at the fashion and design sector. And we know we are desperately short of small business units in Baines. Walcott Gateway, the redevelopment of the cattle market car park, and the corn market, a building that has sat neglected and empty for far too long to provide new homes and an enhanced public realm. And finally, the Fashion Museum, which will move into the old post office building and into some of the buildings along the north side of New Bond Street, a great addition to our cultural offer and a keystone part of the Milson Street Quarter development. The potential here for public-private partnership is substantial and work has already started on this. There will be improvements to the public realm 
further reducing the dominance of vehicles and prioritising walking and wheeling, whilst making the area fully accessible to people of all mobility levels. We will repurpose upper floors of council-owned buildings to provide more residential use. More residents living and working in the city centre, creating a greater vibrancy and sustainability to our urban environment. We will deliver high quality architecture into our UNESCO World Heritage Site city. This is an opportunity to make our mark with buildings and public areas that both reflect our heritage and to deliver for our current and future needs. This does not have to mean pastiche buildings and I look forward to the proposed solutions that architects and designers present to us. It goes without saying that we'll be focused on delivering all of the above in a sustainable way. We intend to reduce the carbon footprint of the area both by retrofitting existing buildings to improve energy efficiency and by new buildings being zero carbon. The construction industry is already gearing up to the challenge of net zero. And by the time construction starts, I'm confident that we will be offered solutions that work within this administration's stated aim of net zero by 2030. I want to talk about the old King Edward School building in Broad Street and its importance to the plan. This Grade II listed building has been in the hands of its current owners for over 25 years, and in all that time it has sat empty. There is no indication that the planning permission granted in 2021 to convert into a hotel with a restaurant and bar will be implemented. There has been in fact no contact with the owners despite our attempts to engage, apart from us being advised that those plans are now on hold. This beautiful building is deteriorating to, to such an extent that it is now the only building in Bath that is on the, that is on the historic buildings at risk register. I say to the owners, that of course any business has its first duty to its shareholders, but it also has a duty of care to the community within which it operates. You are not fulfilling that obligation to the people of Bath and North East Somerset. The redevelopment of Milton Street Quarter provides a golden opportunity for you to be a part of this project and a part of our community. Please embrace it. In summary, this is a hugely exciting project one that will bring employment, housing, inward investment and a fantastic cultural attraction to our city. And I, for one, cannot wait to see it come to fruition. Thank you very much, Councillor Redford. And I am happy to, to second this. This is a prime example of uh, Liberal Democrat administration that is not just thinking short term, but is thinking long term regeneration for all residents of Bath and North East Somerset. This, there have been so many pipe dreams that have popped in and out of, uh, of council papers over the years and decades. This is a, a reality. This is something we are committed to for the long term. It will transform the centre of the city, uh, an area which has been neglected for far too long. And the Fashion Museum itself will be as outstanding attraction as the Roman Baths, and it will be a welcome addition to the, the centre of the city. So this is a really exciting paper, and everybody that I speak to is looking forward to that part of the city being regenerated. So I'm more than happy to second that. Well done, Councillor Robert. I'll open it up. I believe there is... Councillor Samuel there would might like to make a um, proposed amendment. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, as you say, uh, before I speak, I want to give notice that I intend to move an amendment to the report's recommendations. I welcome this report uh, arising from the intensive work I oversaw between 20, 2021 and this year. The master planning work is the most in-depth study of this important sector of the city for decades. It started as a response to the fact that Milsom Street as a commercial trading area was in decline, with retail premises increasingly harder to let as private sector confidence drained away. For the council, this was of serious concern because we have a heavy concentration of ownership in that area and the impact on our income streams needed to be protected. We all want our city to be a vibrant, <coughs> diverse trading area, and where it is not, we need to take action. I'm very pleased that WECA have also recognised this and have supported our work both financially and in kind, and the Mayor's personal interest in this project has been welcome. Now, whilst I was Cabinet member responsible for this scheme, I was determined to make sure several things happened. These were that there should be strong engagement with the private sector and businesses, which there was, but the ambition that you have referred to, to move the Fashion Museum within the quarter, should be secured by the acquisition of a suitable building, 
and this would act as an anchor and complement our wider heritage offer, and, it, and we have done that. But derelict sites uh, such as the Cat Market and Corn Exchange should be finally redeveloped, as Councillor Roper has referred, and that plans should be brought forward to enhance the street scene and restrict vehicle movements within the area that we have studied. Finally, and this is where I turn to my amendment, that the former King Edward School building should be brought back into use as soon as possible. Chairman, this important building has remained vacant since uh, it was acquired by Samuel Smith's Brewery in, in the mid-1990s. It has a checkered planning history uh, with applications made and withdrawn over that period. However, by 2010, planning permission had been granted for a hotel plus ancillary dining. And in that application, English Heritage commented as follows, that whilst the owner has carried out repairs to the roof to make it wind and weather tight, the building remains vulnerable until it has sustainable new use. In the intervening decade, that comment remains as apposite in 2022 as it was in 2010, and little tangible process, progress has been made by the owner to restoring this building to use in line with the granted planning consent. This is unacceptable. The council has done everything within its power to enable the owner to bring forward plans and achieve planning and listed building consent. And yet the building remains vacant and visibly deteriorating to the extent, as Councillor Ruper said, that it is the only listed building on the National at Risk Register in Bath, North East Somerset. So I'm therefore calling for officers to urgently explore all available options for bringing this building back to use, including consideration of the use of Section 215 notices, the various powers under the Planning Acts to compel the repair of listed buildings, and if, be ne if needed, as a final last resort, the use of compulsory purchase powers. I would like officers to engage with Historic England and the Bath Preservation T Trust in bringing forward the report that we are going to call for. However, I recognise that it is essential dialogue be established with the owners to determine their intentions. So I am calling for officers to engage with Sam Smith as soon as possible. And my amendment, which I'll read out in a minute, calls for the bringing back of a comprehensive report to the meeting of this cabinet in February 2023. Chairman, there is no possible reason why the owner of such an important building in the heart of the Bath Conservation Area and World Heritage Site should fail to bring this building back into use. Relevant permissions have been sought and granted, and the owner now needs to engage constructively with the council to be begin work to renovate and use this building. So my amendment is, I'll read it out because members of the cabinet may not have seen this, it's an additional recommendation. Cabinet therefore instructs officers to explore all options, including, for example, compulsory purchase, to enable this historic building to be brought back into use and ask officers to bring back an update report on those options to the cabinet meeting in February 2023. So I will need a second for that. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to, to second. Uh, this uh, amendment, it's very clear that something must be done to bring this building back into, into proper use. Uh, and I'm aware that over the years, and it has been many, many years, many options have been explored. And it seems that now we need a, um, a concerted uh, and um, logical uh, progression going through each and every step so that this building can actually finally be brought back into use. So very happy to second this. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. So I'll ask uh, Councillor Roper, are you happy to accept the amendment? Okay, so the amendment becomes a substantive, so it's incorporated in the main. Uh, I'll move to the debates then, please. Nobody for the debates, okay. I will move to the vote then, all in favour, including the amendment. Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. So we have seven eye papers to go through. Um, I'm going to give a ten minute bathroom break if people need it. Yes? Okay. People come back at 25 past, please. Thank you very much. Yeah. Group. And I just wanted to add.
emphasis uh, because you're embarking on such a, a major consideration. I wanted to add emphasis to the cabinet question I put to Councillor Arson Bourne as a cabinet member, uh, where I did ask, would it not be prudent not to dismiss the contract in its total, but take extracts, extracts of that contract that might be an advantage to us, because it's a huge undertaking against the pressures of the cost of living crisis, the spiral inflation, and the problems that the hospital and the council are experiencing over hospital discharges. Now, I did in the report read that um, you have a, manifest, a manifesto commitment, and uh, in that I read it, and it says the actual wording says that you are committed to bring the service, the service back into in-house where it's practical and financially able to, able to do so. Now, I know that we were very uncomfortable with Virgin passing it across to HCRG, but, and, and I thought that that was the reason, because of that move, that why you as an administration chose to terminate the, the contract or not extend it by that further three years. But you made that manifesto three years ago. And so you were intent on whoever was, who, who, whoever was taking charge of this, that you were going to see about bringing that service back into your house. Now, what I would say is bringing it back in house I was around when the, the service was dealt with in-house and it wasn't working. That's why we put that out to Serona. And Serona, again, had its problems, and that's why Virgin Care won the contract. And Virgin Care had its own problems. Virgin Care came in its t to its own, and when it became an exemplar of how a service should be run through the period of the pandemic, and that's why it was so disappointing but for us all across party that it passed the HCRG without any warning to the council. Now, what I would say is, it, uh, and, and, and again, referring to HCR, uh, HCRG... Can you, can you sum up, Councillor Bridgeard, please? Sorry? Can you sum yeah, up? Uh, just to make this little point, that HCRG now, they've just opened and they led the, 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 the directive with other agencies to open Ward 4 in St Martin's Hospital that has 23 step-down beds, which is exactly what we've been aiming to do. So they're doing some good things, and to terminate it there, I don't know how much notice you're going to take of me, probably absolutely none, but what I would ask is that the executive are happy to work closely with scrutiny around community services transformation program going forward because it's such it's going to be such a, a challenge no matter what and what i don't uh, agree with is all of this is going to be financed out of adult social care reserves and i don't think it's the most prudent way to operate but that's a personal comment thank you Councillor Pritchard. i'd just like to point out uh, that um liberal democrat policy is to, to look at any service that we feel is, is not uh, providing value for money of the taxpayer and to bring that in-house if necessary. The uh, Liberal Democrat manifesto is not aimed specifically at a particular contract. It is any contract and that is that is very sensible for any political party to do because that is, that is food financial management. Right, I take your point, but it, in the middle of this report, it actually says it was a commitment in the yeah, manifesto. Well, no, 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 you can talk over me, not yeah. accept it, but that's a fact. Yeah. Kevin, some, some incorrect facts have been given out there. That is not the sequence of events that happened. The contract, which was seven plus three years, as Councillor Pritchard knows, because he, he, he let it, the, the Cabinet was given the option of extending the seven years to ten, and it did so. However, subsequently, a month later, as we all know, the Council was informed by HCRG that, of a change, uh, that they had acquired the business from Virgin, and as Councillor Pritchard rightly says, we had not been informed about that. This was not a manifesto commitment in the sense that you have described it. This administration, did, this Liberal Democrat administration, did not go into the 2019 election saying, we are going to bring this service back in house. And that was borne out by the fact that we granted an extension in 
2021, uh, as we've said. So uh, the facts are slightly wrong there. You've kind of mangled that up, I'm afraid. And I, I have to correct you for the record because that is not the sequence of events that happened. The subsequent decision um, was a consequence on the events that happened, as we all know. So I think it's really important that that is recorded correctly, but not in the way that you've put it, because it's actually not true the way you put it. Now, I'm sure you've did that with the best intentions to express the, co the concern that you have. But it's really important, given this is a commercial contract and it still has time to run, that the facts are correct in this public setting. Thank you for clearing up, uh, Councillor. No, except Sorry. that, that those facts are correct, but I was under pressure Can to be a very brief so I, to chair, it. I think the chair has been more than generous in allowing you to, to comment. We'll move on to the business, please. Councillor Bourne. Okay, thank you. Yes, Richard has made the clarification that I was going to make, so, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right, um, yes, the, moving on to the future of the community services contract. The work outlined in this paper stems from the decision taken on May the 26th not to extend the HCRG contract, resulting in the existing community services contract for health, social care and public health services coming to an end on the 31st of March in 2024. Cabinet has previously been appraised of the joint programme of work that is underway to manage the transition, with work streams led by the ICB, public health and by our Director of Adult Social Care. This is a, it was a joint decision. There were two uh, bodies that made the decision around the future of this contract. One was the NHS, and one was um, uh, the local authority. I think it's clear that it's important that that's understood. This paper focuses on the adult social care element of that work and examines three potential options for future provision of both statutory social care functions and the services for adults with learning disabilities. The options include, firstly, recommissioning service delivery for Bath and North East Somerset. <coughs> the second option is insourcing service delivery, i.e. bringing social care staff back in-house. And the third option is to set up a new organisation to deliver services in Bath and North East Somerset. The clear recommendation is that we insource all adult social care services. This will bring us in line with the vast majority of local authorities and will give us more control over our service provision. We know from the recent experience of bringing some residential nursing and extra care housing services back in-house that this is likely to receive support from the workforce. It should help to improve recruitment in the currently current highly competitive job market. However, it also represents a significant amount of work and we need to give clear authority for the Director of Adult Social Care to work closely with HCRG Care Group on the transition. There is a robust process in place to oversee this work programme. Risks have been identified and are being managed. I am in receipt of monthly progress reports and a further joint paper will come back to Cabinet in February next year. I propose that the Cabinet supports the recommendations in this report. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm very happy to second this proposal. Recently I had a member of staff shout out to me from a window of a care home how happy they were that they have now come back to the Council. Clearly staff are happier working for the council rather than alternative employers. They, become, they believe they can give a better service to those in their care and at the end of the day it is the residents whose care, um, who we care for who must be focused on. We know that employment security is very important in keeping staff in this very challenging field of work. Working for the council will give staff greater job security as well as greater pride in the work that they do. I think um, I was going to talk for longer, but uh, I will leave it there and just say that I'm very happy to, um, to second this proposal. Thank you very much, Councillor Mayor. Uh, open debate. Nobody wishing to talk. Okay. I'd like to thank Councillor Bourne's team for the hard work, and this is obviously, they're obviously doing a very good job. Um, so we all appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'll move to the vote. All in favour? 
And it's unanimous. Thank you very much. I move to item uh, 15, sorry, and I'll ask uh, Councillor Mayor and Councillor. I should go. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Colleagues, I'm very pleased to be proposing this paper, which provides an update uh, on the development of the land off English Coombe Lane. This project, in my mind, exemplifies much that this administration believes in. Firstly, that we are a listening council. Like many of us here, a number of residents had grave concerns about the previous development which had been proposed for this land. Whilst delivering 14 affordable homes, the 37 home scheme had, uh, which had been previously approved by the planning committee had, in the minds of many of us, too much risk, not least of all to the sensitive ecology of the site. This Lib Dem administration listened to these concerns and acted on them with Councillor Guy making the commitment to not pursue this previous application. Instead, we looked again at the site and put front and centre two of our core principles, that of improving people's lives and tackling the climate and ecological emergency. Be in no doubt, this proposed development has the potential to immeasurably improve people's lives. As the paper makes clear, we have a significant undersupply of supported living provision in our area, especially for some of our residents with learning difficulties and or autism. As a result, there is an increased risk that we as a local authority can only provide the support needed through residential care outside of the Bath and North East Somerset area, thereby placing significant additional pressure on the individual their families and, of course, increasing the cost to the council. And so bringing forward this proposal to use the land off English Coombe Lane to provide a smaller, bespoke development to support 16 residents with learning difficulties is something which I believe we should be proud of as we seek to directly improve the lives of residents in our area. Indeed, it's just the latest example of how this Lib Dem administration is determined to play a leading role in the delivery of appropriate and affordable homes under our new Baines Homes programme. It follows on from, from the delivery of other supported housing schemes delivered in recent months, and later this winter, the opening of our first general needs council houses. Furthermore, rather than seeing the ecology of this area as a liability, one to be literally transplanted to another area, we have sought instead under this proposal to use it as the asset that it is, an asset which, through this development, will be protected and enhanced for the benefit of us all, not least of all the new residents, and thereby through this we stand firm to our commitment to the climate and ecological emergencies. The paper details a number of ways in which we will seek to meet these commitments, from the commitment to energy efficient low carbon housing to the enhancement and protection of the ecology, all underpinned by our commitment to seek to achieve the building with nature accreditation on the development. I fully appreciate and recognise that this site remains a controversial one, and that some residents, especially in the local area, have serious concerns about any development on it. In this regard, I'd make special reference to local ward councillor Jess David, who has, who has worked tirelessly to highlight and reflect these concerns to me, councillor Guy and the council officers involved, concerns which she has tonight reiterated and highlighted in her public statement. I find it hard to think of a ward councillor who has worked so hard to represent their residents on a single issue such as this, and it is Councillor David who is responsible for seeing the commitment to the building with nature accreditation being made uh, in this paper for any development which has progressed. To these residents, Councillor Jess David and others who share concerns, I reiterate the commitment I've made in my meetings with residents. Just as I, Councillor Guy and officers, have already met with residents to openly discuss our plans to date, I and the administration will continue to engage with them and share our thoughts the findings of technical reports and our development plans in a manner of transparency and respect as the programme develops. I thank them for the time that they have already given me and for the time that they will give in our ongoing engagement. 
And so on that note, colleagues, I'm pleased to move this paper and seek your approval for recommendations 2.1 through to 2.3. Thank you, Councillor Davies. Uh, ask Councillor Ball the second, please. Yes, I'm happy to second this paper. Um, Councillor Davies said most things that they're actually saying. I think he's done very well. I, I drew credit to Councillor Davies and the work he's done to get this scheme brought forward today. And also to Councillor David, David for, the, for the work she's done in recognising the difficulties here. I will go back on a bit of history, though, because I, I, know, some, I know a certain former councillor will be shouting on Twitter tomorrow. That is all evil. I mean, remind that person that he placed in a 2017 placemaking plan that piece of land as the local site. It's a 2014 core strategy and every local plan before that. So, Councillor David highlighted the difficulties there. We've been brought forward, we've listened, we've sorted it, and moving forward now. So, I don't want to see anybody shouting tomorrow morning that no one's listened. Excellent point, Councillor Ball. Thank you very much. I shall move to the debate. So, Councillor Samuel. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm delighted that this proposal has finally been brought before us, and I would like to thank Councillor Davis and the officers for the hard work in delivering, de devising this scheme in a very difficult location. When the previous scheme received planning consent, I visited the site, and I was appalled to see the local impact on neighbouring houses through overbearing building on land that is higher than English Coombe Lane itself. The scheme was, as Councillor Ball has just said, correctly prepared in accordance with planning policy set out at that time and approved by the then Councillor Goodman. But it was too high a density and would have negatively impacted on the local biodiversity. I was also concerned that the council, were the Council to scrap the scheme at that point, this would have led to a 750,000 revenue reversion the majority of which had been incurred by the previous Conservative administration. As finance portfolio holder, I considered this impact on the Council's finances unacceptable, and then and with Councillor Romero agreed that we should commission a scheme that had less environmental impact and fulfilled a useful social purpose. That scheme is here before us today, and it achieves both objectives, I'm delighted to say, and I will be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor. So Councillor Ball. Thank you. I'm also in favour of this proposal, as it is a much smaller development than the one approved by the previous administration and is more suited to the site. It will safeguard the sensitive ecological features of the site and will also provide much needed accommodation for people with complex needs. Many such individuals are currently living out of area, which makes it difficult for them to sustain relationships with local friends and family. It makes it more difficult for health and social care staff to monitor the quality of their placements. And as such, out-of-area placements often provide poor value for money. Our adult social care transformation plan includes the goal of developing services to meet more people's, more people's needs in the local area. This will help us to achieve that goal and will help to improve the life experience of some of our residents with the most complex needs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Um I'll ask Councillor David to sum up, please. OK, happy to move to the vote, then. All in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. I move to item 16. Thank you. Um, colleagues, in, in 2019, we all made a commitment to the residents of Bath and North East Somerset, a commitment that we, as a Lib Dem administration, would build the first general needs council houses in our area for a generation. Under the resulting Baines Homes programme, this Lib Dem administration has ensured that the council has played a direct role in the delivery of housing to our residents. With an initial focus on supported housing programmes, this winter, we will be opening our first general needs council houses at 117 Newbridge Hill in Bath. These will be at a social rent level, which is typically between 50 and 60% that of market rent. These first seven units are the first council houses for a generation, and never has the need for social housing been as great as it is today. Our area is one of the least affordable in the country, 
And with rents rise increasing, it will come as no surprise that today we have several thousand households on the council's waiting list for social housing. The first seven units in Newbridge Hill form just the start of our ambitious programme of delivery under our Baines Homes programme. Indeed, councillors were updated at the latest climate emergency scrutiny meeting in October of our pipeline of properties, which is now nearly 200 in volume, when Midland Road and Bath Western River sites are also included. Tonight in front of us is the residential tenancy policy, which underpins how we as a council will operate and manage our own social housing properties from when the first properties open this winter. As a council, we aspire to be an exemplary landlord, and the policy includes a range of customer-facing policies and statements relating to tenure, payments, repairs and maintenance, antisocial behaviour and complaints. And the policy follows established custom and practice in the social housing sector. And so, colleagues, as we approach the opening of our first properties, I'd like to pass my thanks on to the officers who have worked so hard to not only produce this policy, but who have brought us to this exciting stage of the Baines Homes programme. And I hope that you will join me in supporting the adoption of this residential tenancy policy, and I move the recommendation to do so as requested in paragraph 2.1. Thank you, Councillor Davies. Councillor Ball, second. Yes, I'm very happy to second this policy, and uh, I would like to congratulate Tom and get this, this, this stage itself. When we set this out three and a half years ago, people said we'd never get anything done, and we'd never get any council properties delivered in a four-year period. We have. Tom, well done, get this forward itself. I remember going back in the, in the 1990s and sat in this chamber, in that chair, as chair of the council, as but Bath and North East Council, Council cross party, apart from myself, my wife and Be Betty Perry sat across there, their local Labour councillor, refused to vote with the recommendation to hung my head in shame and we handed our housing over. Bath City Council was exemplar in its housing and had good policy. Wonsdag, I'm afraid, didn't. The Wonsdag residents tipped the vote, so we actually put it out to. to what is Soma housing? Now, residents will tell you how good Soma are. I'm not going to run anybody down this evening. But they were not as good as the former council housing we had in-house in Bath at the time. We got, it's coming back. It's going to take a long time to build a good portfolio up. But I'm sure we'll be out there making sure our residents and those who live in our council houses in the future have an excellent prospect in going forward. I hope it will bring the social landlords around up to standard as well, and really challenge them to improve what they're doing. Good, but thank you, Councillor Ball. I'll open up for debate. Anybody wish to talk? Uh, ask Councillor Davis to sum up. Okay, happy to move straight to the vote. All in favour? That is unanimous. Uh, thank you very much. Put microphone on. Can Item 17, so consultations of a Bath Clean Air Zone, charging order 2021. Uh, Councillor Rigby, to move, please. Thanks very much, Chair. <clears throat> the key ask that I'm bringing to Cabinet today is at 2.2, in that I would like to start a consultation involving key stakeholders on the introduction of a charge for Class N3 Euro 6 diesel HGVs, together with some associated local exemptions. Since its implementation 18 months ago, the Bath Clean Air Zone is showing progress in improving local air quality, and this impact has been felt both inside and outside the zone. But we are setting our sights higher for our residents than just achieving compliance with legally imposed limits. We want our air to be even cleaner. We will continue our journey to net zero whilst preserving the world heritage status of our city. Further measures that we've already delivered include emissions-based charging, improving active and sustainable transport infrastructure, and my colleague Sarah Warren is delivering the first pilot livable neighbourhood schemes during this month. And this proposal is to be seen as part of the package to continue this progress. Early engagement has already taken place with the relevant trade organisations, and statements from trade bodies, including the RHA, have been received in letters received after these papers went out, but they have been circulated to all Cabinet members. So what precisely am I asking of you? Were the order to progress successfully through consultation, 
the charge is deliberately set lower than the existing charge to deter the use of the older, more polluting vehicles. For the avoidance of doubt, HGVs, which do some of the more local deliveries as part of the supply chain for our local businesses, predominantly tend to fall in the under 12, 12 ton category, which is specifically excluded from this order. In recognition of the amount of work the industry has already done in upgrading vehicles, there will also be some time-limited exemptions and a period of soft enforcement to embed the behaviour change. So, my ask is to go to consultation on a new charge, which will encourage even more of the most polluting vehicles to upgrade their fleet or use alternate routes which, would, which avoid the congestion and pollution hotspots in the city. This will further protect the recently repaired Grade 2 star listed Cleveland Bridge, and I have agreed with my colleagues, as you could see at 3.9, that traffic flows both within and on the boundary of the area, in areas such as South Down, Twerton and Western, will be monitored and published and appropriate mitigation measures considered. Thanks for sticking with me on this quite technical proposal. Um, I urge you to support this motion. Let us engage in a wide consultation on this charging order. And let's keep Bath and North East Somerset at the forefront of improving air quality for our residents whilst protecting our residential amenity and our world heritage status. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rupi. Councillor Warren, a second, please. Yeah. As the Cabinet heard back in July, we've seen significant reductions in nitrogen dioxide levels both inside and outside the clean air zone since its introduction in March 2021. And in almost all locations in Bath, we're now seeing nitrogen dioxide uh, within the legal level of 40 micrograms per cubic metre. Um, Cabinet pledged last winter that we would be more ambitious on air quality and look to go beyond legal levels. I'm delighted that this evening we're taking another step in that direction with this paper, which looks to develop charging mechanisms for HGVs, and I'm happy to second the pro proposals. Thank you, Councillor Warren. I'll move to the debates. Councillor Romero, then Councillor Samuel, please. Thank you. As um, Councillors Rigby and Warren will be aware, there have been um, quite uh, a lot of concerns raised about the, uh, the, the impact, the consequences of both the clean air zone and also the closure temporarily of Cleveland Bridge and um, you know, particularly around where traffic is being displaced to. So I, I welcome the inclusion and the and this, how specific it is uh, of uh, paragraph 3.9, as I think my residents in, in South Dan and um, I believe in, in Twerton as well will be uh, concerned that more uh, HGVs, even if they are lighter vehicles, uh, will also be on the roads, uh, uh, key roads in and around South Dan too. So I'm very happy to support this because of the inclusion of 3.9. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Samuels, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, residents in Walcott will be delighted that the Council is proposing to consult on changes to the charging order to charge HCVs over 12 tonnes through an amendment to the charging order. For too long, residents along London Road, and there are thousands of them, have had to endure the ceaseless cavalcade of these vehicles, many using Bath as a shortcut. Charging these vehicles in the terms that Councillor Rigby has outlined, will encourage haulage firms to think more carefully about the routes they select because there will be financial consequences for them. And I, I do recognise uh, the point Councillor Warren made that there is, we are on a trend here of improving air quality and that is to be welcomed, but we have to keep the, keep the momentum going and this will do that. I should just say, by, just in finishing, Although by UK standard this might appear to be a radical policy, in fact other European countries are way ahead of us. France now requires drivers to display an emissions sticker if they wish to enter designated urban areas across France. Failure to do so brings an instant 130 euro fine. And most cities in France have seven and a half ton absolute lorry bans. So, you know, we've got some way to go, but this is in the right direction and I, I fully support this proposal. Excellent point, Councillor Samuel. Okay, so uh, I'll ask Councillor Ruby to sum up. Uh, happy to move the vote. Uh, all in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, 
The West of England Combined Authority has been awarded £540 million over the next four years now to deliver a step change in public transport and active travel funding in the West of England. This funding package is known as the City Region Sustainable Transport Settlement. The programme will deliver significant public transport and active travel infrastructure along several of our major roads in Bath and North East Somerset, together with active travel routes to those, uh, to those roads and to connect with hubs. Um, it will improve connectivity between our communities and enable better and more equitable access to sustainable transport choices. This rather procedural report simply requests agreement to move to the next stage by delegating approval to the Directors of Sustainable Communities and Place Management in consultation with the S151 officer to accept grant funding from the Combined Authority and <coughs> noting that for schemes which remain led by the Combined Authority, Bath and North East Somerset officer time will be recharged to WECA. This will be undertaken through a process of quarterly recharges. I move the recommendations as in the report. Thank you, Councillor Warren. I ask Councillor Wood to second, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be seconding this motion. Uh, as car usage continues to dominate, it's uh, essential that we give people a more viable travel choice wherever possible. I'm especially pleased to see references to connecting villages to one another and also connecting the Summer Valley to Bristol uh, through the A37 corridor. Uh, an off-road walking and cycling track following the broad ridge of the A37 would uh, go uh, a great length to help take pressure off this busy road. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Move to the debate. No debate. No, I think this is a, an excellent uh, programme. Thank you very much. So I'll move straight. Let's ask you to sum up, Councillor Ward. No, I don't think you were going to say anything. No, move straight to the vote. All in favour? Splendid. That's unanimous. Thank you. 19. Us. Councillor Samuel for the 23-24 medium-term financial strategy. Councillor Samuel. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, the medium-term financial strategy, I'll call it MTFS for brevity, uh, is the spine on which council budgets are constructed. It sets out an assessment of the financial climate the council expects to encounter over the next five years and is used to inform the budget setting process. There are a number of key points I want to highlight. The Council is still in recovery from the financial shock created by the COVID pandemic, when members will recall that it was necessary to introduce an emergency budget in July 2020. Now, whilst the immediate financial impacts were successfully managed, there are still longer term impacts, particularly arising from future income assumptions that require close, close attention. During the past year in particular, we have seen challenging economic conditions at national level with the growth in inflation, labour and commodity shortages and pressures on wage growth following 10 years of austerity. The Conservative government's response unfortunately has made matters worse, particularly the catastrophically incompetent mini-budget in September. While some of these shocks could and should have been managed better, no one could have foreseen the impact on global energy markets arising from the illegal Ukraine invasion. Whilst the short-term energy support will be welcomed by residents, they are short-term, the Council, with, business, with all businesses, remains exposed to the impacts of energy price rises, and these cannot be contained within normal budgets without government support. The MTFS sets out some core principles which it's worth repeating. Budgets will be expected to balance without the need to draw on unallocated reserves, and the strong reserves position achieved by this administration will be maintained. Growth, either by demography, inflation, or political priority, can only be accommodated where headroom has been created. Priority will need to be given to key statutory services and policies that contribute to tackling the climate emergency. Council tax and social care precepts may be expected to rise over the period in the absence of any other government support and further income raising opportunities will need to be sought and current income streams maximised. Now this report highlights the continuing lack of local government finance reform first promised by the Conservatives seven years ago. Across the board pressures are rising and I fear that the coming years after the next general election in 2025 offer stark choices and difficult decisions in setting council budgets. The autumn statement next week will hopefully provide extra clarity, but after 12 years of Conservative austerity, there really is no fat to cut. 
I particularly want to thank Andy Rothery and his team who have put this very detailed report together. It's an excellent piece of work, and Andy this time has looked ahead at the general trends in the economy and how they might affect the Council, and that is set out in the, in the MTFS. So, Chair, with that, I move the recommendation. Thank you, Chair Samuel. I'll uh, ask Councillor Davies to second, please. Uh, colleagues, I know it's been mentioned before, but as we consider this key financial paper, I think it's just worth reflecting and saying how good it is to see our colleague and friend Richard back in the, back in the chamber and in charge of the finances. Um, uh, since, uh, and just to reflect on that, since May 2019, Richard has demonstrated remarkable leadership of the Council's finances. Working with the Council's senior officers, they have steered us through three extraordinarily difficult financial years. And in all the years, not only balancing the books, but also facilitating our ability to deliver throughout all areas of our manifesto commitments, many of which we have seen further evidence of tonight. Um, after the events of the last few years, one would have hoped that we could have been spared more turmoil and challenge, but as the MTFS sets out, this is not to be. As the strategy shows, with current forecasts, the Council is projected to have a pressure of £36 million over the coming years, with the main pressures being the significant inflationary pressures we're seeing in energy and, and indeed now throughout the expenditure, and pressures on our income, while we also expect to see our, an increasing demand on our services throughout this period, most notably as the report shows in adult social care and children's services. We need to be open and transparent with residents, that, uh, as we are in this strategy, that to achieve these savings, there will be some very difficult and challenging decisions to be taken. Decisions that will inevitably have some impact on the support the Council provide. But we also need to be clear that this position has been worsened still further by the disastrous actions of this Conservative Party. With the global economy slowing and inflationary pressures growing, this Conservative Party embarked on an ideological experiment with all of us as its guinea pigs. And in September, Liz Truss and her colleagues, many of whom still find themselves in leadership positions, crashed our economy with their disastrous fiscal event. Through these reckless actions, we are now poorer as a nation, our residents are and will continue to suffer as a result of the cost of living crisis, and as a council seeking to support our residents, the government is silent on what support we will have at this time. We stand alone with our residents as we experience one of the most disastrous periods of national leadership in our history. We will do what we can, and whilst the purpose of this report is not to detail how we will respond specifically to these pressures, residents should be in no doubt that this Lib Dem administration will continue to demonstrate the sound and strong financial leadership required to navigate the Council through these challenges. We have delivered to date and will continue to do so. And colleagues, on that basis, I'm happy to second this paper in the MTFS. An excellent second. Thank you very much, Councillor Davis. Uh, I'll move to the debates. Nobody? I'll ask Councillor Sandler to sum up, please. Excellent. Happy to move the vote. All in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Move to item 20, Revenue and Capital Budget Monitoring, Cash Limits, Revenue of April to September 2022. Ask Councillor Samuel to move, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, it was astonishing to me when I took office in this role that the previous administration failed to produce budgetary quarterly budget statements. I was clear that every quarter needed to be reported to ensure transparency, but also that management actions to deal with problems with budgets were initiated. Today's report, I regret to say, reflects the extremely difficult financial environment all councils are operating under at the, mo at the moment. The, 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 the Council is on course currently to overspend its set budget for 22-23 by 4.5 million this year, and that is if we don't do anything about it. There are three areas of variance causing this problem. Surging demand for children's services and the very high costs of placement accommodation charged by the private sector and a 5.4 million overspend is, is expected in that service. Contract inflation is rampant 
passing on the high levels of inflation in the national economy, now exacerbated, as Councillor Davis has said, by Kwarteng's disastrous foray into free market economics, which he probably didn't even understand what he was doing. Hikes in energy prices have fueled inflation, and the impact of the nationally agreed local government pay settlement has created 2.2 million of unbudgeted pressures. Now, these pressures are mitigated to some extent by strong income from heritage and commercial estate and parking. However, I am not prepared to reach year end with such a deficit, and so the management team have been requested to look at a range of measures to control and reduce in year spending, which will be managed through a recovery board reporting to me and the leader. Measures such as a vacancy freeze, limits on discretionary spending can be expected, and I'll report the impact of these measures to the February Cabinet meeting when we cover quarter three. However, it's not all bad news. I can report that the 22-23 savings target is largely on schedule to be met, something the Conservatives only occasionally managed during their last four years in office. There are some specific environments set out in the report to note, uh, which you are asked to approve, together with changes to the capital programme. I also need to record that it's very pleasing to note that the increased costs for replace, repairing Cleveland Bridge will not fall on local taxpayers as it has been met by external grants, and that is noted in the report. So, Chair, with that, I move the recommendations set out in this report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask Councillor Davies a second, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, colleagues, many of the financial and service demand pressures, especially in children's services, highlighted in the medium-term financial strategy, which we've just looked, have manifested themselves in the current year and are reflected in this quarter two report. Richard has provided further context and detail behind our financial position, but I would again know that the Council's leadership has already taken action to put a framework in place through the Financial Recovery Board to manage these pressures and work over this next quarter to further develop mitigating actions. We are also fortunate that the very sound financial leadership over the past three years means that we are able to draw upon our contingency reserve to support our work at this extraordinary time if required. With my thanks to Richard and the officers for this paper and for all of their work over the coming weeks and months, I'm happy to second this paper. Thank you, Councillor Davies. Uh, I'll move to the debate. There's no one who to speak. Ask Councillor Samuel to sum up. I move to the vote, Chair. Uh, happy to move to the votes. All in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Last item of the evening, which is item 21, Treasury Management Monitoring Report, the 30th of September 2022. Ask Councillor Samuel to move, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll be extremely brief with this uh, because of the hour, and you will be receiving the same report at Council next week, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, this is the usual report uh, that uh, we receive, regular report that we receive. Uh, looking at Treasury practice within the Council and its compliance with the SIPFA Treasury Code of Practice. So the, the indicators uh, that have been used are being noted, you're being asked to note those, and you're being asked to note, and I won't repeat some of this, many of the factors in the report have already been covered in the two previous items in relate, relation to the movement of interest rates and the placing of investments. So, Chair, I'll stop at that point and just move the recommendations. Thank you, Councillor. And I ask Councillor Davies to second, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I, as I will be briefer still, and given this is coming to Council again next week, I will add no further words to this uh, and happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Davies. Move to the debate. There's no signal to talk. Ask Councillor Samuel to sum up. Move to the vote, Chair. Happy to move to the vote. All in favour? Thank you. That is unanimous. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance today and for watching on, the, on YouTube and I will close the meeting. Thank you very much.